Welcome to the Tambellini Group's New Normal in Higher Education. I'm Rachel Clemens, and joining me here today is Dr. Michael Berman, Chief Information Officer for the California State University System. Welcome, Michael. Hi, Ray. Good to be with you. I'm so uh, delighted to have you here today to talk with me about the new role of the CIO. So you, along with me and our colleagues, a couple of other colleagues, have done a, a number of conference sessions over the years about the CIO role being the best job on campus. You remember that? Yes, I do. Okay, so that was pre-COVID, though. Uh, do you still feel the same way about the CIO role? Well, I, I, my first thought when, when I saw you were going to ask me that question was that of the five people who were in that presentation, two are no, not currently CIOs. So, <laughs> um, But no, look, it's a great job. It's, it, it's of, of, uh, more so, I think, than most administrative jobs in higher ed. You can make it what you will, and you can mold it to your strengths. As long as you're a good match with the institution you're at, which is something we talked about quite a bit before. Yeah. Um, you know what? First of all, who has a job on campus anymore, right? I mean, most well, of us true. are not on campus much of the time. And um, who really has a good job? I mean, a good job is one that you're not getting laid off from right now. Um, so, I mean, I think all academic jobs are really, really hard right now for everybody. Um, I don't think the CIO is the hardest, probably the hardest is the director, director of faculty development right now. But, um, uh, you know, yeah, it's challenging. And um, I see a lot of my colleagues working long hours and feeling a lot of pressure. But I don't think that's that different from our colleagues in academic affairs or finance or facilities or anywhere else. I mean, it's a hard time mm -hmm. right now for everybody. And it's a hard time on campuses. So. Is yeah. it just all happy <laughs> rainbows and unicorns? No, but um, it, it continues to be a job where you can really make a difference and have a big impact. And, um, and, and as I say, because most people don't really understand what we do, you can, you can have a lot of control over how you decide what, what to focus <laughs> on. So I'm curious if you think that the role has changed at all in the last year, you know, sort of post, I know we're not post COVID, but in the midst of COVID, or if you think we just have a better understanding and appreciation for the role because of COVID? I do think that um, um, it's it's been a lot, I think a lot more people on campus care about what we're doing than they did before for obvious reasons. They're just much more dependent on us. Um, in many cases, remarkably, you might think it could go the other way. I think they're more appreciative of what we do. I think in a lot of cases, the work that CIOs and their teams have done over the last few years where they've made decisions about technology and architecture and services that, you know, other people on campus maybe went along with, but they didn't really understand why we were doing it. Identity management thought, strikes oh, me as one of those. Yeah, identity management, <laughs> a cloud computing, um, um, mobile computing, um, resiliency, agility, all those things that most of that the CIOs that I respect have been trying to push things in that direction for many years. You know, I, I just, I'll just give you one example. And this, this is nothing that I did, but it was an IT, something that really IT pushed for at the chancellor's office. And I've only been there less than a year, so I really wasn't part of this decision, but they really pushed towards having everybody have a mobile computing device. So there's no desktop computers. There's maybe a you know, a tiny number that were for very special uses. Everyone else had a the same laptop and um, or, or Surface. And boy, did that make sense when people started walking out of the building. It was like, pick up your computing and take it with you. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that probably the IT perspective was, well, first, this will be good. People appreciate it down the road. And also, we don't want to support multiple devices per user. Let's give everybody one device because that's going to be a lot less support than if they've got a desktop and a laptop and a, a tablet and so forth. So the, the goal was to, as much as possible, let everyone have one device. And that just turned out to be a really good decision. And I think people are looking and going, you, you know, it seems like you folks saw it coming because you, <laughs> you, know, you had that ready. You know, we had, we have cloud telephone system. So we had already started, um, uh, going to soft phones as an option. Yeah. And um, so it was like, well, how am I going to receive and place calls when I'm at home? It's like, we've got that covered here. It's it's already done. Um, so those were good decisions. I, and as I say, I can't take a lot of credit for those decisions in my institution because I was, 
I'd only been there for five months when, when COVID hit, but, <laughs> but I think that, um, you know, again, the, the IT leaders that, that I respect were looking for the kind of technologies that were very, have been very effective in COVID. I mean, you know, we had, we had 550,000 Zoom licenses and, um, so we didn't have to scramble to deal with that. And, you know, there, there have been, and there continue to be different opinions about exactly how Zoom operates and, what the implications are, but the reality is we're doing, we've done uh, something like a billion and a half Zoom minutes um, since since COVID started. So people are using wow. it. Wow, that is and, a huge number. Yeah, um, as, of, as of June, um, it was 22 million Zoom sessions. So, um, you know, is it is it or is it not the very best possible tool? I don't know, but when you've got um, 55,000 faculty and staff, and they all have access to the same tool. That makes a huge difference, you know. And and when you have 23 presidents, so you know, you know, the CSU, we've got 23 campus presidents and a chancellor, and they were literally on Zoom calls every single day for hours. I mean, God bless them. I'm sure that was not fun, but but that they could do that because the alternative 10 years ago would have been teleconferences. Right. So how much work could you've really got done? with three and four hour teleconferences. So, and they were doing it with very little tech support, right? I mean, the tools have gotten good enough and consistent enough that, you know, maybe the first couple of times they need help, but they're just not clicking and getting into a meeting. So, um, you know, and again, it's not about Zoom. It could be Teams, it could be something else. The, it, the, the, the big thing is that um, the, the standardization is another thing that, you know, IT people and CIOs like, and there's always a difficult, dance between like telling users what to use versus wanting people to have the freedom and the flexibility to use the tools that work best for their work situation and their environment. And, and that's, you know, and that's kind of the art of being a CIO, deciding how far you want to push and how much is persuasion and how much is telling people what to do and how much is letting them do what they want. But it's this almost was almost like, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just going to say, it's almost like that, that, you know, um, the the objection of like we don't really understand why uh why you're making us do these things or why you're advocating for you know just laptops or standardization all of a sudden COVID hit and and people realized oh well this is not just this but this is a really good example of why right right well i mean i think people were shocked in our situation and again i want to it's you know being a cio at a chancellor's office in some ways is a lot easier than being a CIO at a campus because there's no students and there's there's no faculty, although there's there's a lot of former faculty. But um, so that you know makes a lot of decisions easier. But um, I think people were were really surprised when I basically sent the entire IT staff home, and they really didn't notice. <laughs> I mean, there was, and it was like, call the if you need help, call the service center, and someone will help you. You call the service center, someone's taking the call at home. And right. if they did, and and then chances are, you know, nine times out of ten, they can help you remotely. And if we really need to, you know, replace your laptop, then we'll just make an appointment. We'll meet you at the loading dock and grab your laptop, you know, and give you a new one. Yeah. Um. So, um, I, I think that a lot of people called the service center, talked to somebody, had no idea they weren't in the building. Just assume. Right. And we yeah. were asked, well, how many people do you have in the building on a regular basis? We have 175 employees, and I said zero. We have zero there on a regular basis. We have a few who need to go there pretty much every Monday morning. The folks who kind of tend the desk, the laptops go in and kind of look at shipping and receiving and broken break fix kind of things. First time they work from home and yeah. everyone else is at home virtually all the time. Yeah. So, so getting back to the CIO role then, there's this really been this longstanding debate about the role, you know, whether it's a strategist, whether it's a plumber, I saw a tweet recently from a colleague of ours, um, another CIO at an, another, another institution, who said that maybe it's neither. And what he tweeted is that CIOs should need to pivot from technologists and strategists to becoming humanists. And I'm really curious what you think about that statement. Um, you know, when people uh, ask me um, what my career is, I like to say I'm an educator. And, um, you know, I, I do have a, a perspective that's not the same as every CIO because I started out as a faculty member. But I think that I, I would like to think that if you were a CIO at um, Verizon, 
you would think your job is to help connect people with telecommunications. And if you were a CIO, I, I met the CIO who works for, uh, I met a few CIOs who work in, say, the fashion industry, right? Right. And their role is to help people have access to, you know, luxury fashion goods or whatever it is, <laughs> or, or inexpensive fashion goods, or, yeah. you know, it, to, to help people. Um, if you work at Amazon, it's for customers to be satisfied with, the, you know, be able to buy anything they want and get it immediately. That's your role not to support technology, right? So right. Um, I think that in my experience, the best uh, CIOs in higher ed are deeply committed to higher education. doesn't mean that they've spent their entire careers in higher education or they're not going to go somewhere else later. But while they're there, if you're going to be a leader in your organization, then be a leader in your organization. And that means you're tied to the mission of that organization. And the technology is always in service of that. So if being a humanist is is core to the identity of your learning institution, then you should learn to be a humanist. That's a really good answer. As you look towards the future, where do you think this role is headed? So we've talked a lot about, you know, in the past it being the best job, and there was a lot of reasons why, that diversity, that, that you know, sort of ability to see across the institution. As you think about the future now with all that we've learned, or at least all that I think institutions have now seen about what CIOs can do, yeah. where do you think the role is headed? And, and do you think that that'll be different um, than, I, I guess, is it headed where it should be or could be is, is kind of the question. Like, what should it be and where is it headed and are those the same place? I think that very slowly, regardless of COVID or anything else, it really has become more and more a strategy role and less and less a operational role because we just don't have as much stuff to operate anymore. I mean, That's you just operate email servers, right? Most, very few of us operate email servers. Um, we're moving CRM systems to cloud-based systems. We're moving infrastructure to infrastructure as a service. We're buying identity management as a service rather than implementing it. Um, we're buying database services rather than licensing databases and running them. You know, not this is not all happening at once, but this is the trend more and more over time. So. Um, you know, networking, like think how often networks used to go down and, and you know, like having expertise with Cisco and people were going in and editing the command line and stuff. You know, I mean, there's still people, we still need engineers who have that deep knowledge, but we don't need as many as we used to. And they don't necessarily have to be on our staff anymore, right? You can, right. You can buy networking as a service. You can buy all sorts of things as a service. And um, over time, it makes less and less economic sense for us to do those things ourselves. So I do think that um, pure, the size of a, the sort of pure IT staff in most institutions as a function of FTE is going to go down regardless of the current situation. Um, right. the, the number of people who maybe are uh, educational technology experts and work with faculty might go up. But the number of people who, you know, support the network, support the servers, you know, how many how many days a week does your staff spend racking and stacking servers? As we used to say, they used to be a big deal, right? For most of us, it's not unless you're at an institution, say, that has maybe a big scientific installation or something. But right. for a typical higher ed, you can get by with, you know, you could operate if you're building your campus from scratch. Would you need any servers on site? You know, maybe for a few very specialized things that need to be at the edge, but they could probably fit in a closet the size of your smaller than your clothes closet. You know, <laughs> data center. You haven't seen my clothes closet. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. pretty I small. Mean, it's, it's, it's it, it. You know, it probably could could fit. You know, in the size of the smallest faculty office you've ever seen. You know, and right. um, as opposed to it used to be. Um, you go visit another CIO. I always knew what kind of CIO I was visiting. It's like, they say, you want to see my data center? That always told me they were somebody who really saw themselves in a technical kind of way. And I'm just like, yeah, show me your data center. Oh, that's really cool. We've done the cooling, get the wires up, very neat, looks great, you know. Um, and and versus a, a, a CIO might say, hey, I want to take you to a classroom and show you what we do. Or, let's yeah. go meet some students. this innovation center, yeah. Yeah, let's go to the innovation so center and see what faculty are doing. So. Um, and, you know, and lots of people straddle both those lines, and it's not a judgment. It, different institutions need different types of, of roles, and someone's got to care about that. The, I, I like nice, neat wiring as much as anybody, but I don't think the CI, that's not the key role of a campus leader, I don't think. 
Yeah. You're saying that you said the traditional, that the traditional or pure, I think is the word you use, IT roles, you, you would expect to diminish. But I would think you would expect to see a, an offset or even an increase in the, you know, the non-pure, right? Sort of the business analysts and the, the product managers and, um, you know, people who are really thinking about the use of technology more so yeah. than the bits and bytes of it. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, but depending on the organization, a lot of those people are not going to report to the CIO, right? right? I mean, there was a reason at a time when they had to. In some organizations, it may make organizational sense, which is the way they're used to doing it. But, you know, if you're a data analyst, are you really better working for IT or working for student affairs if you're analyzing student data all, all day long? And do you need technology expertise? I mean, IT needs to stay close to those people, support them. They need to help them make good technology choices, they need help with information security. There's lots of sort of consulting and supporting roles. Those people don't necessarily have to be on the IT staff. They might be, but they don't they don't have to be. What they have to be is they have to be subject matter experts yeah. and they and people who spend time communicating and understanding the needs of people on campus who are doing roles where they're going to use the data and analyze the data and present it to the stakeholders and um you know and so they need good Good data analytics skills, and I think I would suggest a strong technical, you know, skill in the sense that they can really use the tools and can push how those tools can support them. Right? I mean, it's yeah. not you know, not doing a pivot table in Excel. It's really pushing the envelope yeah. in towards of how the technology supports you. And IT has an important role in kind of putting an architecture around that, making sure that people don't start building little mini IT departments all over campus, that they don't create information security problems. So I think that. The good IT departments are figuring out how to support those departments in their work, and um, they're not they're not as concerned about um, having to sort of own those people centrally necessarily, unless it makes sense for a particular campus. So as you think about this role, right, the more strategic role, a more distributed, maybe not even centralized in IT sort of environment, um, you know, what do you think this means for current or for aspiring CIOs? How should those folks begin preparing themselves for these future roles? I'll prepare to be a leader, prepare to understand <laughs> the mission of an organization, learn how to work with people, how to listen to people, communicate with them, how to take what they say and take their ideas and turn them into action and turn them around and show them that you're listening to them and that you can deliver for them. Um, you know, I, you and I both know that there are IT leaders who come from very strong technical backgrounds. There are people who are programmers, there are people in networks, there are people um, who, who, there's also people who come from support roles, who come from AV, and then there are people who come from history and philosophy. And, you know, my, my, I was um, a political I'm scientist. Political science. I just, you know, we just hired a deputy CIO. His degree is in music. Um, so, but he spent a long time in higher education and he's a deep understanding of what we do and, and how to work with people. So, um, it's, I, I would say that everything I would say about a CIO in higher ed is the same as any, if you pardon the expression, business leader. Um, though we're not like most businesses, we're a different kind of business, different kind <laughs> of business in a lot of ways. And then the additional thing is I think the really great leaders in higher education are going to be higher education leaders. So they're going to understand the, the, the challenge, special challenges of higher education and be ready to work within them and um, learn the kind of arguments that are persuasive, understand what the needs are for higher education, care passionately about the mission of supporting students and helping them achieve their goals. So that's the plus factor. So I, I always tell um, you know, one of the things I tell uh, uh, mentees, pardon the expression, sounds like a mint, but, you know, people ask me, they say, well, what do I need to do? And we'll discuss what they've done in the past. And what I say to a lot of people is, have you ever taught a class? And um, if they haven't, I say, you know, I think it'd be great, you know, if you have the right credentials, if you have a master's degree, a lot of community colleges would love to have you teach an information systems class. Try it once, yeah. you know, and see what it is to be alone in, a, in that room or online with that that class and have that challenge and that res that very difficult responsibility that you're trying to reach all those students and help them be successful and then go back and meet with the faculty. 
Yeah. And you'll you have a different view of what their role is. I agree. I had that. Ex I, I was fortunate enough to have that experience um, when I was at Menlo. Um, and it absolutely changed my perspective about the, the CIO role without question. It's a very different experience standing up in front of a class of it was probably 20 students at the time. It wasn't big. And they're yeah. all staring at you and they're all expecting you to do something and the technology doesn't work. And you're like, ah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, then you're going to feel a lot differently when a faculty member comes up to you and says, I'm so frustrated about, you know, XYZ auditorium because the damn projector in there never works. You know, it's just yeah. going to feel different. I think when you can put yourself, you have the empathy to put yourself in their shoes. Um, doesn't mean that you're going to agree strategically with, you know, the president of the faculty senate or something you might or you might not. But I, I think you will have. Um, if you aspire to that role and you want to be in higher ed, then then that's a good thing. And if, if you were in, you know, um, the postal service and you wanted to be say of the postal service and say, you know, spend a day with the mail sorters, you know, see what they yeah. go. Go out on a route with a with with one of the postal carriers and see see what their challenges are. And so that would be my advice to any CIO. Be really understand who who you serve. So as much as I agree with you about it, you know, the being the same guidance or advice that you would give any, you know, business leader, any other VP or C-level role in higher education, I think part of the reason we had that strategist plumber debate was because institutions, some, tend to shoehorn IT a little bit differently, I think, than mm -hmm. other roles. Somehow you're the tech guy. Even if you're the gal, you're still the tech guy. Yeah, yeah right. I so, um, so I guess part, parting shots here, you know, we've talked about what I, what IT leaders should do to prepare themselves, but what about institutions? How can, what should they be doing to, to kind of take advantage of this next generation of IT leaders and all that we can bring to, to the institution? You know, a lot of, a lot of institutions, for example, have um, institutional leadership programs where they, you go around and you spend time with, you meet all the vice presidents, you spend the time talking to the president, you go to the Senate meeting, you go to different things and you maybe have some assignments some reflections and things that you do. I think those are great programs. And I think you can put a CIO through the same program that you put, you know, if a future CIO can go through the same program that a future vice president for student affairs can go through. So that would be one thing. You know, there's a saying, you know, don't try to teach a pig to sing because it just annoys the pig and it's not going to sound good. <laughs> you know, if, if your institution does not see technology strategically, um, then you might want to find a different institution. You know, if, if 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 it's the people who don't know anything about technology are going to be making all the technology decisions and not consult with the technologists, and they don't show any sign of changing, then that's probably a good sign that you're probably if you're want to be a technology leader, you're probably not going to find yourself at that institution because you're not going to talk them out of it. Yeah. In my experience. Okay, so I think that's the sage advice for the day. Don't teach a pig to sing. I don't think I've ever heard that expression, Michael. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with me today. It was really, um, it was really great to to listen and learn from you. Um, I oh, really it was great appreciate to talk. it. Thank you. Thank you.